do this a view and overview of what I'll be uncovering today. All right, so there's a total of six topics. The first one will be touching a bit on the concept plan and the master plan. Secondly, the regional centers. Thirdly, urban transformation, all right, the types, the initiative, and of course, understanding how these two align. Fourth, we'll be touching on the practical application of Changi East region. Fifth, how to invest in integrated development, okay, okay. the price trend and its growth, key attributes of an integrated development as well. And finally, how do we apply the Changi East region plan with Pasiris 8 development? All right, so we'll touch on topic number one right now, concept plan and the master plan. Just to let you know, the very first concept plan that came out was way in the 1971. And of course, we talk about the last one that we had was actually in year 2011. This is a strategic and transportation land use plan that plans Singapore over the next 20 to 30 years. So you realize the last one is 2011, the most recent one should be coming out in this year or if not next year, okay? And of course, this is also in alignment to the master plan as well that is actually being produced, okay, every five years, all right? But of course, when they are planning at the back end, okay, this is a further detailed implementation of the concept plan. So basically, when they're planning at the back end, it's about 10 to 15 years ahead, but whenever they show it on the URA center or if not in the URA website, it's every five years. So the last one we had was in 2019, and the next one should be coming up in the next three years or so, which is 2024, all right? Then we don't talk about the regional centers, all right? What are the regional centers in Singapore? So over here itself, what is even regional centers is basically second tier commercial zone after the main CBD precinct, all right? And it's 15 times the size of a normal town center of a HDB. So it aims to approximately serve up to 800,000 people in each region. And its main function is to decentralize the congestion and services of the CBD precinct. And then mainly we have four regional centers that have been earmarked by URA. Okay, the very first one namely is the Tampines Regional Centers. It was first introduced in the 1992, all right? And the second one we have is actually Jurong Lake District, which is in the 2008 master plan, all right? And then further on, we also have Woodlands being earmarked as well in year 2013. And finally, we also have the Salita Regional Center, which was introduced around year 2015. But this is pretty much quite prematurely because of the COVID situation right now. And of course, the budget terminals has been relocated there as well. All right. Not just that, we also have the sub-regional centers also. So in the recent master plan as well, we actually introduced in 2019 draft master plan, we actually have the Bishan being earmarked as a sub-regional center. So what is sub-regional centers, right? So look at it, the good old days, we actually have Pile Bar also earmarked as a sub-regional centers in the 2013 master plan. And look at what it is today. It has rose prices from even a thousand three or thousand four hundred dollars per square foot. Over the span of seven years, we have it today, Park Place Residences, you know, is reselling at about 2,000 PSF or so, okay? And finally, we also have the One North precinct itself, which of course, uh, in recent time, we have a very good, so-called a good 80 to 90% setup on the One North Eden. Okay, so this itself has been the main key driver in the good old days. And then shortly after, we also have the R&D and the innovation cluster that the URA planners has also uh, earmarked as well. So in the northeast side of Singapore, we have the Pongo Digital District that is slated for completion in 2022, okay? And that itself basically is being envisioned as the Silicon, the next Silicon Valley of Singapore. And then we talk about the Jurong Innovation District, which is going to complete also in year 2022 as well, where government actually pumped in four billion dollars from the research and innovation grant on, on technologies and businesses like fine tech, robotics, etc. okay? And it stretches all the way from Tengah to NTU. It's a very, very huge plot of land. All right, and then finally, we talk about the next one. We have the Dover Knowledge District. This is a very interesting site. Three white sites that forms up this location. All right, and of course, white site, we know that it can be used for three different usage. One is actually for grade A offices, integrated development, or if not hotel usage, right? Okay, so there's three white sites for this one. Likely should be completed in the next seven years because whenever you are a, uh, envision something in the website, usually it'll take seven years to complete. All right, so this is my marker for it, all right? So the next one, we also have one off as well, which is right now we are on the seventh phase, all right? Which was won by JTC, actually tender it out to Hobi Land. So basically this is what we are looking at over here at phase seven right now. And then finally, the UR people then put both together, all right? They merge them together and then they call it the economic gateway and key growth area. So in the Northern side of Singapore, we actually have the Pongo Digital District, 
merging together with the Woodland Regional Center, and then we call it the Northern Gateway. All right. And the western side of Singapore, we have the Jurong Innovation District, merging together with the Jurong Lake District, and then we call it the Western Gateway. In the southern, or you not the central side, we actually have the relocation of the four ports. All right. Mainly we talk about Brani, Keppel, Tanjung Baga, and about Pasir Panjang, shifting all the way to Tuas. All right. And of course, we talk about the Greater Southern Waterfront Initiative, freeing up, I think, 2,000 hectares of land over there. All right, 9,000 new homes will be injected over here. Okay, and HDB being among the, the 9,000 new homes. And of course, I think there's a pilot study, or you know, there's actually speculation that HDB in this prime area in the recent news, that they are going to have lesser lease, right? So that you will not actually have million dollars resale HDB flat. So this is very interesting, and these are all happening within the Greater Southern Waterfront precinct. And of course, we talk about James Dyson coming in here as well, all right? And yeah, so there's also a resort called the Downtown Resort that will be also be allocating here, mainly towards Century Scape, all right? There's also a water catchment between the Straits of Brani and also the main island as well, okay? So very exciting plan happening in the Greater Southern Waterfront precinct. And then on the east, and of course, we then call it the Central Gateway. On the eastern side, we have the relocation of the Paya Lebar Air Base, all right, all the way to the Changi Precinct. All right, we also have the Changi East Region Plan as well over here. So basically, what is the Changi East Region Plan? We talk about the injection of a new mall called the Gem Shopping Mall, all right? The government uh, paid around $1.7 billion of dollars for. And this is, of course, today's main study. We also talk about the introduction of SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design, together with, of course, the Terminal 5 as well, together with the Changi Business Park as well, forming an ecosystem, right? And we call this the Eastern Gateway. So guys, how many of you are already overwhelmed by what I said so far? If you are just type, if you are learning, just type you are learning. So I know you are learning and it's not a one-way traffic here, right? The more you reply, the more you will learn. Wow. Okay, great. I see John replying, Rachel, Chin. Okay, good. Everybody is learning. Fantastic. Guys, remember, the more you reply, the more you're learning. Don't learn on a passive manner. Sit there and watching a movie. This is not a movie, guys. I know I speak very fast, but because I'm given only 60 minutes to do this. So do absorb as much as you can. Do reply me as well, because the more you reply, like I said, the more you are actually reacting, this will go in, into your brain. All right? So next thing, we then talk about the urban transformation plan. Okay, so what is this urban transformation? Basically, you'll find this on the URA website as well. Okay, but uh, in main gist for you, what it means is that it's actually targeted at key growth area. Okay, for economic growth. Okay, so uh, there's four things I'll be sharing over here with you based on the action plan by URA on this urban transformation. But I want to share here is that this is not something that you will find on the website. That is something I decipher after looking through the entire website as a whole. All right. So I break it down in four very simple action plan that what the URA people are doing. So the very first one we talk about is actually relocating our existing assets for new urban planning. So for this kind of structuring, it will take the longest to manifest. All right. So what are these or what are the kind of action plan that we see under this category? All right. We will see something like the relocation of the Payaleba Air Base, which is 800 hectares of land, okay, all the way from Payaleba, all the way to Changi, okay. So with this kind of, uh, you know, we talk about extensive project or initiative, you will usually take about 20 to 30 years to manifest. In the good old days, we will then talk about the reclaim, re reclamation of the Marina Bay piscine as well, all right. So it's exactly what we are looking at over here. And also, we just now mentioned the Greater Southern Waterfront transformation as well, where we relocate the four ports all the way to Tuas, all right? So the next one we talk about is actually introduction of new township and business center, all right? So for this kind of, so for this kind of uh, introduction, right, we'll be seeing a very, very uh, familiar site in the 2013 master plan, something like introduction of maybe the Bidadari town, for example. And then the next thing we talk about is probably the recent time introduction, the new town called Bayshaw Town. All right, which has made seaside residences being one of sought after development, launching in about 1007 PSF and today going in about 2001 if you see the sub sale. Okay, and then next one we see is basically something that's on a mature estate already. We talk about rejuvenating existing infrastructure for extensive urban planning. So this is something that we saw things already happening. For example, 
Jurong Lake District Plan that was introduced in 08, and right now we are still going through the second stage of the blueprint plan. So we take a lot of white side over there. Okay. And then finally, we have the fourth one over here called the revitalization of the existing heritage and recreational spaces. So for action plan number four, I would say that this kind of plan doesn't really add much, uh, you know, catalyst effect in terms of price appreciation. Why do I say that? It's basically something like, for example, uh, conservation of the Kampong Glam Piscine. And in this kind of, or if not, extension of the greenery along the railway, uh, railway track of the real corridor planning. So things like that doesn't really add much to the investment perspective. It's more onto uh, conservation of historical value, okay? So I will not touch so much on number four action plan. The next one over here, we talk about urban transformation initiatives. What do we have? The one at the top itself is actually by URA website. When you look at it, you should be able to find it there. But what I have also, based on the three action plan, I've actually allocated for you. I've also added in this transformation initiative as well, okay? So what I've shared just now, okay, on action plan number four, this is based on my own opinion, okay? These three falls under that. The rest of the action plan falls under the rest of the blue color ones over here. So what I have shared just now, I will not repeat it. Those new ones, I will share it. So I just want you to understand this initiative so we can then target the entire Changi East region from a holistic standpoint, okay? So over here, we talk about Greater Southern, Front, Greater Southern Waterfront, which I've touched on it already. The next one is Kalang River, you know, the Kampong Boogie site. There's 9.2 hectares of land. So this is very interesting. We talk about from Stadium Boulevard all the way to ICA building, right? It's about 9.2 hectares of land over there. And there will be that transformation of the Kalang River or Kampong Boogie site. HDBs over there are going already at 1.15 million. Correct or not? Okay. So uh, 9.2 hectares of land, there will be 4,000 new homes over here, all our private homes injected into this precinct over a span of 11 to 13 years. That's what we are looking at in Kalang Riverside, okay? And then we also have the Bayshore Town area, 60 hectares of land. Over here, we have 12,500 new homes that will be coming in as well, all right? So very close by to our Changi East region plan, if you say, all right? And out of the 12,500 new homes, 6,000 will be allocated for HDB, whereas 6,005 will then be allocated for private housing. All right, and these are all going to be very interesting because it's the first time BTO houses are facing seafront, other than, of course, the Greater Southern Waterfront Initiative, okay? So over here, like I mentioned just now, seaside residences actually benefited tremendously through the Bayshore Town Rejuvenation Plan, all right? Then we then talk about the, the speculation that even Marine Parade HDB flats will also be going through a search program because they are originally a lot of older people there. So in order to protect the Mandaka generation, all right, they are going to give them new flats in this Bayshore town. So let's see how it works out, all right? So we did talk about the bottom area, of course, Woodland Regional Centre, we are touched on it as well. We did talk about Bitadari town. If you don't know how big is Bayshore town, it's probably very close by the size of uh, Bitadari, which is 57 hectares of land. We didn't talk about in recent time, we have the Ophir Rocher Corridor, where we have the Midtown we talk about, uh, yeah, Midtown Modern sold for around 2006 PSF, where close to 60 to 70% of the units has been sold. Very, very well sought after, even uh, during these few months, right? So even before that, we talk about before we have the lockdown, we also have the M by wind time, and that was amazingly sought after as well. We have 70% take up rate, and PSF also went around 26 or even 27 PSF, all right? Then finally, by this, we've talked about it, Jurong Innovation District, we talked about it. Tengah New Town as well, one of the towns with the most number of BTOs that has actually been introduced. Okay, so about 8,000 of BTOs have been introduced so far and is aimed towards being a forest city. And Novena Health City, basically 250,000 square meters of researcher space, institutional space, and with additional 10 buildings are all injected over here. Of course, we already started more or less completed, but what you want to do here is that Look at the master plan over here, just to give you some golden nuggets, right? If you look at the CDC, all right, which is the communicable disease center just behind, there is actually a change of use. So CDC has been rezoned as a residential plot. So it's very exciting plan here because we have not seen a huge plot like that being introduced as a residential area uh, in this precinct for a long, long time. So do look out for that. And finally, we then talk about the Beauty World Integrated Transport Hub. Okay, so what is it? Integrated Transport Hub. Basically, we talk about 
for my mesh rapid transit coming down to and bus interchange coming down to underlings to actually uh, a shopping mall integrated and of course with the cross on the line coming through as well so over here itself uh, basically what we are sharing about is the urban transformation initiative by way of URA website and based on what I share as an action plan so I hope you get uh, some golden nuggets from here from this particular uh, page that I'm sharing. All right. So the next page I'm going to go into is actually how does this then apply in terms of investment? All right. Or not? All right. So this is the project timeline chart where I share and I plant them into different numbers. So for a lot of clients that I work with, I share with them that look today we buy into something we should already know when we are going to exit the property, and that is where you can then plan that so-called safety net for them to run through the entire EMI. All right. So uh, with that in mind, if you talk about here. Uh, over here itself, we talk about project initiative at the top, which is Pailiba, Airbase, and Greater Southern Waterfront. We then talk about the announcement date. When did the government actually announce this initiative? We then talk about the construction date, the different phases of exit, all right, and how did it apply, all right? So the next thing we talk about is actually the introduction of new township and business center. Okay, so this is actually uh, what I shared with you just now, but we talk about uh, under category. I have slot them under Bidadari Town, Pongo Digital District, Bayshore Town, Kampong Bumis, Kalang Riverside, and even the Jurong Innovation District. And these are the different exit plan. And then we talk about, finally, the third one over here is rejuvenating existing infrastructure for extensive urban planning. Okay, so guys, how many of you want to learn how I apply one of these, you know, uh, initiative, so-called the transformation plan, and then people would have exited, which is Changi East Region plan, People who have exited in phase one in 2018 already make 32% gain. Okay, I want more, so I'm going for 2021 exit. How many of you want to learn what is my top process? What is my consideration when I actually invested in this property? And why am I exiting in phase two, which is 2021? If you want to learn, all right, just type in the chat box here. I want to learn. So I know you want to learn, not because I just want to show you, then you want to see, okay? Fantastic. Great, great, great. Wow, okay, good, good, good. I'm glad so many of you want to learn. Huh? Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, great. So I'm going to jump on to it right now. And uh, this is how it's going to look like, all right? So this is application of Changi East region. Okay, we are on topic four right now. We have two more topics to go and then uh, more or less we'll then uh, finish today's uh, sharing, all right? So this is me, a lot more fatter back in uh, 2014 when I was 28 years old. That's where I bought into this development called Coco Palm, and that's my wife, okay? So it's shown on the straight time that this is the top gains for mass market leasehold condominium transacted over a period of five years from 1.4 all the way to 1.8, okay? And in this entire straight time article, Coco Palm is actually the top performing properties uh, over these five years. And to share, basically, if people would have actually a bit of reflection here again, People would have actually exited back in one day actually make 32%. I want more than 32%. Okay, and how do I go about it? Okay, so these are actually my uh, some visual for you if you don't know where Coco Palm is. Okay, so Coco Palm is actually just across from the MRT train station, 250 meters apart. Number nine is so from 08. Okay, and guys, it completed only year 18. So when I bought this development at that time, right, it's going to be very personal with you here is that. A lot of people say, AKS, hey, yes, you sure or not? You buy this, when you collect the key, left 89 years, you sure can make money or not? Okay, so uh, there is another rule called the lifespan cap rule. I'm going to talk about it today because it will then be another overwhelming thing for you. So it's going to keep that aside for another day, all right? But I just want to let you know that that is actually based on that rule. That's why I actually bought based on this 89 years this home, okay? And then we talk about the indicative price range. It's about 1,003 PSA. We're going to exit anytime. Uh, this is done maybe about, about good, what, nine months ago. So this is actually nine months ago price point, okay? So like I said, I want more. What should I be considering or why even I choose here, okay? So first thing first, we talk about major investment by the government, okay? So there is one major investment back in 2013 uh, National Day Rally. So the government announced that they're going to pump in $1.7 billion worth of investment, okay, during the National Day Rally. And they are going to pump in into this area call, of course, the Changi, okay, and basically to reposition Singapore premier air hub in the world, okay, and of course, this construction of the Jewel Airport uh, was then announced there. Then we talk about who is the architect, 
I then found out he's this guy called Moshi Saudi. Okay, so he's actually the Prisker Prize recipient, also known as the Nobel Prize for Architecture. So in a nutshell, he's actually a star architect. All right, so I didn't go and look back. Who is this guy? What have he done before? And then I realized that he's the, actually the, the builder, the architect for this uh, Marina Bay Sands. Okay. So I then realized that hey, if you have actually go to, you know, during staycation, during this period, especially we can't travel, right? We then realized that, hey, uh, many people who are actually taking pictures, they no longer take pictures with the Malayan anymore. People are taking pictures with this building, okay? And with this building, which has no historical background, just because it's a star architect, it receives so much attention, all right? So later I then realized that he, he was also the one being allocated or commissioned this product, all right? So, even David Beckham was later also the brand ambassador for MBS. Isn't it amazing just because of the star architect? So I then thought from a public relation perspective or PR perspective is that right now it's no longer just a beautiful building and then uh, David Beckham comes in, right? Right now it's actually a collaboration between Saudi Architect and Changi Airport Group, which envision themselves to be the best air hub in the world, or if not Saudi uh, Saudi architect with Singapore Airlines, which envision themselves to be the best airline in the world. Okay, so in the transportation line over here, government to double MRT network by two o three zero. Okay, Jurong and the Cross Island line was announced. So this is something that I was doing a research, and then I realized that hey, in the LTA master plan, they come up with something on the January two o one three. Okay, so what it means is there is this Cross Island line that was announced back then, and we see this pink color dotted line that goes through from the eastern side of Singapore all the way to the western side of Singapore. This is the very first preliminary map that I first see and I was like, oh, this is quite exciting, okay? So I then look into the site itself, you look at the gray and you look at the pink color, gray are existing line. Pink are actually the cross island line that we're cutting through. And I saw this line cutting through like that over existing line in 2013. I then realized that, hey, what is that station. So I superimpose it into the Google map and I realized that it is actually Pasiris train station. All right. So we then go into the next stage. I then saw that in one tree as well in September, overseas family school has been relocated for the building of the Orchard Boulevard train station as formed part of the Thompson East Coast line. All right. You guys would have known about this thing. So it was then relocated, but to where? It was, really, it was relocated basically just 1km apart from where I am. So school is very important, especially so we talk about OFS, 4,000 over, you know, uh, students, right? And these are expatriate uh, families. So just across 1km. So very, very, you know, compelling plan plans as well. But all these things doesn't make me put my money yet. So what then makes me put my money, right? I saw this thing called the white suck, okay, on the one tree master plan. Okay, so what it means is that, of course, you guys learn what is white site already, correct? So what can it be used for again, guys? If you are learning what I shared just now, can you just, you know, uh, you know, just put in your answer over there. What is a white site for? Oh, volume is very soft, is it? Okay, let me see what is going on over here. Okay, let me check my volume. Um... Uh, Administrator, you check whether the computer sound in your yeah, the sound can okay. be louder. Yeah, I think it's okay. So it's I think okay. the receiver end maybe have to up the volume a bit. Sure. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Great. So guys, you saw this already. White color side hotel, commercial, residential, integrated development. That's what it's for. Okay. Fantastic. So this is where I finally put my money. Okay. So guys, if you all have children or even you yourself uh, have served the army before, you will know that this place itself. Is already having a bus interchange that brings the army boys uh, all the way to uh, Tekong. Okay, so the bus interchange is there. All right, the MRT is there, and plus the fact that it's a white site. So this is basically a making of an integrated development. All right. So with that in mind, this is where I decided to put my money after I saw this thing. All right. So this is the street plan itself, and this is where the spot is, and this is right now we talk about Pasiris Eight today. So we then talk about this place, of course, uh, this is based on this uh, street map itself. It says TOP2024, back then before the COVID situation. Right? Of course, it's going to take longer time to TOP because it's a huge site and it's going to be also part of uh, public facilities as well, based on this site. So I then share that if it based on 2024, it needs to be completed. It has to launch at least 2021, correct? Right? So when it launched that time, what it means? A lot of eyeball will then be looking at this area, okay? 
and that's where I can then start to sell my cocoa pumps. Okay, so the thing about selling something is about having the maximum exposure in terms of eyeball, and of course, with that in mind, people will then compare prices. Okay, no right, no wrong. Different developments has different attributes, but I just want to share with you here is that there is an exit strategy. Over here, we are talking about when the waters are clean, and this is in 2021 when the waters are going to be clean for, of course, the cocoa pump investment group map. All right, so we then move forward over here. We talk about the white side being tendered by all green properties, okay, and carry properties. So basically, it's by Robert Kwok, Malaysian Tycoon, at a per square foot of 684 per square foot per plot ratio. So of course, this plot itself is actually inclusive of the public facilities, and we, there is actually updated PSF PPR, which is about $840 just on the residential plot, but I'm just going to use the whole thing as a calculation because usually they don't break down like that, all right? So what we then see is that these all green properties are actually holding portfolios such as Great World City, Tangling, Tangling Mall, or even Tangling Place. So Great World City itself, just to share with you, has just went through a rejuvenation of the entire mall. So you've been there in the last, you know, one and a half years or so, you will see that the businesses, F&B, now brands are all coming in. So I will reckon that they will also bring the, kind, the same kind of businesses into this Pasir Ris 8, given the commercial podium, all right? And then when they talk about, of course, how, you, how does it look like? So I stay here, I receive the newsletter, and this was how it was looked like. Uh, I received it like what more than during the COVID situation, actually, when, the, when we just locked down. So this is something very, very uh, interesting and so-called prelude to the residents over here. So you then see that the first floor itself is actually the town plaza. Then, you know, we talk about the second floor is retail, third floor is residential parking. Finally, the fourth floor is the EDEC, okay? They talk about the overview of the entire uh, artist impression. So I just want to share here, does this picture of the artist impression resonate with you in any parts of Singapore? To me, it felt like a cut and paste, okay? Can you resonate this artist impression as any part of Singapore? Okay, if you can't, it's okay. I'm just going to share with you what I think it is. It is more or less look like maybe Paya Lebar quarters where there's so much court, open courtyard space for walking and the prices shoot up from 1,004 $2,000 per square foot, just because of this. And we talk about people buying in $1,007 for Park Place, and right now it's worth $2,000, all right? And then if not, we talk about Jurong Lake District as well, which is, of course, the J Gateway PC. Also the same thing. Prices shoot up all the way drastically to from 1003 all the way to 1007 PSF as well. So we can see that the, the price adjustment can be about $400 to even $600 per square foot just because of this kind of uh, intervention or integration. We talk about transportation line in Pasir Ris interchange. Okay, so in January 25, 2019, basically the government then announced the plan. So what happened here is that I shout what are why? Because Pasir Ris MRT train station was earmarked as an interchange as part of the cross island line. All right. So a lot of people say AK is so lucky and all these things. I just want to share with you here is that all these are carefully curated and pre-planned for before I go into the investment. All right, so this is not luck. Basically, if you went through this course today, you attended the course today, this, is this class today, you will know that this is very important details. All right. Of course, it aimed up to serve up to 100,000 households uh, in 2029. All right, so this cross line will be completed in 2029. And then, of course, we talk about its Changi East Urban District. If you look at the date set, this was introduced on the 19th of June, 2020. It's also in alignment, okay, to what? to phase two of the circuit breaker. If you realize this date is also where we finally able to dine outside in groups of five. So over here, what they said is that this Changi urban district, okay, is basically a new officer smart work center, new recreational tourism possibilities with the Tana Mera ferry terminal, just a stone throw away, okay? And the officers will be ideal for aviation companies, okay? This could also be another vivo city because we also have the Tana Mera ferry terminal being very close by. All right, and it's slated for completion around the 2030s, and this will boost home prices, okay? So number five over here, we then talk about how to invest in an integrated development. So, so you must be thinking, why I say how, not why, correct? Because I come from a place of how, because we want to know what kind of profile can actually benefit maximum by investing into an integrated development rather than just telling people how good this thing is right okay or if not uh, being very product i think we have to also match it to the profile of the buyers all right so over here i just want to share with you here uh, price trend and growth of an integrated development first thing first the very first few that we see out there 
you know, guys, you all, you all know this development called the Central, right? It's basically near Amokyo MRT. Basically, it's right beside it. Right, this is the first few sort of integrated development, okay? And we talk about the location, you can see right next towards the MRT, there's also a shopping mall, there's also the bus interchange as well. So these three key matrix must show, just like what we have at Pasir Ris 8, okay? And back then, if you look at the development size, it's only 329 units. In fact, it was launched around, you know, year 08, 09, or even 10, and finally completed in year 14, 329 units development. We then look at the average rental yield. Okay, just to share back then, the smallest unit for this development is actually 700 square feet to 800 square feet. Can you imagine back then this is the smallest unit and it's two beta, all right? So this size, basically, if you look at the rental analysis over here, for 800 to 900 square foot, which is still under two bedroom, given the last six months, uh, this is just done in the last six months, you see that the number of rental contracts are in two digit numbers. Well, the one in the bigger size are actually in a smaller uh, number of transactions. Okay, even the U itself is not too far off. We're talking about 2.8, 2.9, comparable to a 3.1 that we look at for a big unit over here. Okay, in terms of profitable transaction, I think this will be very interesting for you. We have 75 profitable transactions. And in terms of annualization, in terms of, okay, these are lined up in terms of capital gain sensitivity. So you can see the annualization, that means how much capital gain did it appreciate per annum. So over here, you can see that these are the size, okay, line up in terms of capital gain sensitivity. And these are all the small units, right? So if you buy a general unit over the, over, over across the entire development in terms of configuration, you get a 3.6% uh, in terms of capital gain. But if you choose a small unit, you actually get 5%. All right, so it's very rare for small units to get high capital gain. All right, usually it's the bigger unit. So the next thing here, we then talk about water town. All right, also integrated development. Over here, you can see where is it located at Pongo Waterway, right next to this uh, Pongo MRT. Okay, also have a bus interchange as well. All right, they talk about the number of units, 992, completed in 17. Okay, and the tenure is since 99 of 2011. And average rental yield analysis. Over here, we talk about the last six months, okay? What do we see? We see a 72 or if not 31 rental contract done last six months, okay? And the yield are 3.2 to 3.3. So much higher than the bigger units at about two over percent. Okay, so rentability in terms of demand is very high. And then next thing we talk about profitable transaction. Okay, there's 171 profitable transaction. And again, it was lined up in capital gain sensitivity. So with that in mind, we then see that the higher is 6.5% over here. But let's look at the size. How many of these are actually the small units? All right, it's almost a good 40 to 50% of it, okay? And with that, if you were to actually buy something across the board in terms of our capital gain, we actually have 2.4% in capital gain, but the smaller unit, I actually give you 2.3, just 0.1 off from the general unit or even the bigger size. So we actually have both capabilities of rental and resale demand, all right? Then we then talk about J Gateway, the last, you know, so-called case study I'm going to share with you here. Okay, so J Gateway itself is where it is. And then we are across from basically the Westgate Mall and also the bus interchange and also the Jurong East MRT train station, which is already interchange today, okay? Number of units is 738 units. And it was actually uh, 99 from 1-2. It launched at one three one day after the cooling measure, the seventh cooling measure. Right, crazy, yeah? And it was fully sold out in one day. So it must be very bullish. A lot of people say, hey, buy so bullish can make money or not. So over here, I just want to share that rental analysis over here is that there was over the last six months, last six months, the, all the double digit numbers in terms of rental are under 700 square foot and smaller, okay? And the yield is 3.5%, very high, okay? In terms of number of transactions here, we also have five unit done on the smallest unit. Okay, comparable to the bigger unit, which is done at one or if not four. Okay, we then talk about the profitable transaction. All right, a total of 65 units that was profitable. And again, it was lined up in capital gain sensitivity. All right, so the highest is about 4.4 .4 over here. And we talk about the unit size. These are the number of units that is seven, or I would say 600 square foot or 603 square foot and below. All right, and you can see all are actually in this so-called uh, the chart at the top for in terms of capital gain sensitivity. 
So if you were to invest something across the board, generally the capital gains 2.9%, but if you buy the small units, right, you actually get 3.7%, okay? So over here, Pasuri's eight residences, we talk about 487 units. What do you think, okay? Where's the location? You know where is it already? So what do you think in terms of the profitable transaction is going to look like? Okay, is it going to be the, the small unit, big unit, or what? Or what kind of size? And then also you look at the rental year analysis. Is this going to be on a small one or is it going to be a big one that is more in terms of demand and in terms of you? All right, that one I leave it to you after the 3K study I share with you. All right, so over here, we talk about how to work out developers break even price. This is not say by me. This is actually allocated by 99.co. Okay, so they use a development called Gem Residences that was awarded back in June 2015. Okay. And this is the land cost, and this is actually the construction cost of 350. Of course, right now, construction should be more, all right? But then again, those that have already signed a contract, developer will absorb it as per what we shared during the media release, all right? We will then use this baseline, these two add together, and we use 30% as part of the launch price that developer is going to launch. So this 30% inclusive of administrative expenses, sales and marketing costs, financing the entire construction, Okay, and also their profit margin. So what we want to know here is actually variable profit margin. Then we can find out the break-even price, correct or not. So land cost, construction, 30% goes to expenses and profit margin. It works out to be 1436. Okay, so over here, if you will look at 2015, what was the developer's margin like? Okay, we talk about what well, OA was very high, 30 over percent, go all the way down to 139 over percent, 1410, 15 is also 10. Okay, so with that, I need to take away 10% to then look at the break-even price. So I will then look at 755 plus 350 times 1.2 instead of 1.3. I take away the 10% is 1326. And this was the selling price of Gem Residences back then during launch. Okay, so 1326, this is higher than 1326. This is what we are looking at. And then finally, we then talk about, of course, this is the formula that I shared with you just now. And then finally, we talk about estimated average launch price for integrated development. Guys, this is not something that was said by anyone. This is just a marker that I use. This is a disclaimer I want to share, all right? So based on Pasubis 8 itself, land cost is 684. I'm using, like I said, the whole place inclusive of the public uh, facilities, plus construction cost, plus baseline, which is 207. And then I use a 30% premium for integrated development. And that works out to be 1613. Of course, I heard that the price is going to be higher than this, all right? Which is about 1650 to 1680. But Whatever it is, within this bandwidth and above. So for example, we talk about two bedroom unit, we should be looking at at least eight to 10% higher. One bedroom, definitely beyond that in terms of this price tag. So this is something more for the three or if not the four bedrooms. All right. And then we talk about Tanamera Link by MCC Land, just down the road. In fact, it was awarded, you know, on the 30th of October, okay, to MCC. And there was 15 parties that bid for this land. Land cost was 930. Construction cost 350. If I use the same matrix, I should then see Tanamera to be selling about $2,000 per square foot. Okay? So guys, this is the key attributes of integrated development. A summary of what I share with you based on the three case study here. Okay? So what it means is that the key attributes is by nature, smaller unit types are less liquid, harder to let go. Okay? Investors who buy such unit usually have a lower budget. Correct? Okay? And they focus a lot on affordability and rental yield. And when affordability is key, integrated development fills in this gap, okay? Where rental yield is preserved, while it also exhibits strong resale demand and capital gain. And we talk about for investors who are also very conservative about maximizing their, uh, the leveraging through bank loan, okay? Optimum returns can still be achieved when investing in an integrated development. Why so? Because as the smaller unit also enjoy comparable ROI against investing in a bigger unit type in a non-integrated development. Because usually in a non-integrated development, the big units are actually enjoying the higher in terms of capital gain. But this, what I share case with you just now based on the 3K study, small unit also enjoying the same. Okay, so equity required is way lesser to enjoy the same benefit. So here, lesser outlay, same benefit. So in conclusion here, what I share is that integrated development can give you both capital gain and strong passive rental income. All right. So Recording stopped. Okay. So next thing we then talk about the application of Changi East region with Pasiris 8. 
So how are we going to then use it Recording for Recording in progress. Okay. So over here, we talk about, uh, before I dive into this, uh, guys, you're all learning, right? Are you guys learning? Okay. Okay, what happened, what happened? Okay, guys learning, huh? you guys are learning, right? I just want to pause here a bit to, to see whether you guys are still with me. Okay, good, 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 fantastic. We have finally reached the last stage of this uh, uh, so-called sharing today. Okay, so I'm going to go into topic number six right now. And then from there, we can then go into, of course, how are we going to get people to exit? in terms of the investment timeline, all right? So do take extra note at this time because this is why you are here for today, okay? Fantastic. So jumping on six, application of the Changi East region with Pasir Ris Gate. So over here in 2021 itself, if you have bought in in Pasir Ris Gate, this is how it looks like. What happens? We know that the last concept plan is in 2011. That means in 2021, which is right now or even next year we will have an update of the concept plan, okay? This is also in alignment to what's gonna happen in the master plan as well, because the next master plan will then come in in 2024, okay? So these are two major milestones to look into, all right? And then we then talk about the Tanamera site by MCC land. It was deeded, okay? As mentioned, there was, it's an integrated development. There's 265 units uh, based on this entire land plot itself and it was bidded at $930 per square foot per plot ratio on a leasehold site. Okay, so as mentioned just now, this price will be then around $2,000 per square foot. We then talk about the transportation line. We also have the cross island line that will be completing in 2029. Okay, and this is where I shout what uh, remember, okay. So and then we then talk about the 2030 what's going to happen. T5 is going to complete slated together with the Changi Urban District, all right, where another Vigo city is going to be introduce here okay 2030s when we will, we will then need to look at the concept plan or if not the master plan to give you an indicator right now we only say it's 2030s okay so in terms of investment entry and exit strategy milestone this is what we look into entry point about 1613 for the bigger units of course smaller unit like i said just now 1650 onwards concept plan update and then of course these are the different phase two phase three phase four exit in alignment to my own coco palma but every one of you when you enter at a different stage, you have your own exit strategy. Don't need to follow mine. Okay, and that's for Coco Palm. So for Tanamera, that's where when it launched around year 2022, we then see the first sign of appreciation where price will shoot up to $2,000 per square foot. Okay, and that's that so-called paper value gain of, you know, close to 20%, if I'm not wrong. And they talk about the first exit should happen when the TOP, the next integrated development. If you want to hold long, you also can because the yield is very strong. All right. And then second exit is just two years later, where the cross island line completes. And then finally, we then talk about the other exit, which is the Changi Urban District. Okay. So guys, I have reached the end of my sharing today. I hope all of you has benefited tremendously based on this overwhelming, you know, sharing session that I had. I had the opportunity to share this thing with you. Like I said, it's very fast because I got to do it under an hour. If not, yeah, I think I did it under an hour. Fantastic. It's 53 minutes. I'm timing it. Okay. So guys, I hope you benefited from this. I just want to, you know, wish all of you uh, uh, stay safe during this period, especially so that, you know, we have gone back so-called heightened cooling measures right now. So 